ten rounds all last week. Ten rounds, the old man still has. Sure. Yep. See, let's take it out on your fingers and your wrists. No, actually, I got a real light glow, uh, bag that I call a musician-friendly bag because it's, it has a lot of leeway. Yeah. Actually, I hurt my back punching those big, big, huge, heavy bags. I was rehabbing this knee. I was feeling great, 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 great shape. And man, I was whacking the bag, bang, and I leaned into a left hook. And I was like, I sure hope I didn't do something. And sure enough, the next day he woke up, oh my God. I thought I knocked a screw loose or something. I had to go get another MRI and all this stuff. And it wasn't, it was just like a, whatever. Not not as bad as I thought. That's, and that's half the mental battle right there. Yeah. Especially after six titanium screws and clamps and all this shit. Looks like a nail bomb inside of your body. Whoa. Yeah. Looks like crap. Not a neat job. What happens when you go for a detector of the airport? Zero, it's titanium. Really? Doesn't nah, it doesn't go off. Since I started using titanium. Oh. Okay, folks. We're all set. Yeah. Phone off over there, everybody. Yep. I've got mine on, but it's not going to ring. <laughs> um, I've got my questions on it. So, John, you're on. Good to go. You're running. Yep, camera speeding. <laughs> Blue yell. It's mess with me. Oh! So you come to it? No, but you know, that's besides the point. <laughs> okay, I've got a, I've got a, a, a list of questions. Um, I'm sure. But I'm, uh, you know, I'm also kind of uh, somebody. But maybe at the end I'll ask you a few, a few things I, I'd really love to ask you about. But I'll stick to the script for the moment. So, in, um, we're talking about Pantera and your, you know, the, the amazing band and the, the whole impact of that. But I just thought that, um, that just to hear you kind of talking about what you thought the legacy of Pantera would is, you know, I mean, there are going to be people growing up who didn't get a chance to see you except on old YouTubes, right? but the music's there, it's in the records, it's, it's, what do you think about of the legacy when you think about it now, looking back? Huh, that's a vast thing. It's a plethora of uh, emotions, but I guess one of uh, life's amazing journeys, not your good journey, not your bad journey, not your amazing journey, you know, uh, the legacy, what kind of legacy, hopefully a legacy of distortion and energy that inspires and you know hopefully thought of when you look at the band and the music that was released hopefully hopefully uh, it was inspiring and I know it was so hopefully it never, you know, remains in that light in terms of um you know, metal. Like, uh, you know, amongst the pantheon, you you guys are right up there. Mm. Um, you, you must have been influenced, but also you must have have also influenced. Yeah. yeah, that's the way it works. You know, if you, to, uh, you know, it goes back to the old whatever I, you know, 
I guess the kid who comes up to you and says, Phil, how do you make it big in rock and roll or music? It's like, you know, the most truthful answer would be take 15, 20 of your favorite bands and rip them off to all hell eventually if you keep going with the same unit, meaning the same band members, and you grow together and grow together and grow together that eventually you'll find your own sound. So I, I would say that was the case in for me especially, you know, uh, rock vocalists out there, from old radio rock I, I grew up on in the 70s and I guess the popular stuff I grew up in the, the house with growing up with mom and her sister and dad on and off I mean that's it's such a wide variety of stuff Rolling Stones, Led Zeppelin, Jimi Hendrix Janis Joplin, Queen and then later you know can't leave out Kiss either. I was a baby boy also at one time, but you know, Kiss was a rock group. Peter Frampton, Ted Nugent, Old Scorpions, and later Van Halen, uh, very innovative for guitar work and this elaborate David Lee Roth character and he's a baritone and I was always a baritone so I could match up there. It's like a when you're developing your voice and you're trying to sing these high notes and whatnot with Robert Plant out there and, and David Coverdale and whoever the heck was singing for a band like Deep Purple at the time, Ian Gillen or whoever, they always had these outrageous ranges. So I guess I took to David Lee Roth first of all, first and foremost, because he was a great front man. And, once again, a baritone, but then with heavy metal, there's no leaving out Judas Priest, the mark that they left, nor Black Sabbath. So, you know, Black Sabbath, Judas Priest, and then, you know, but for me, you know, I was there. You know, I was there when these bands went through these massive changes and Music was going through changes. Heavy metal was going through changes. Uh, which eventually brought in what I guess would be known as hardcore music and punk rock, I guess, before that. I, I, I'm a music lover, man. And every to me, every genre that actually has touched me growing up, I've taken a bits of pieces here there whether it be attitude whether it be presentation whether it be the way uh, one guy might pronounce something or other you know it's just you take from every generation and I still learn stuff today you know I'm a lover of underground music a supporter of it so still learn at this advanced age um, like well-aged beef. <laughs> <clears throat> if you were uh, just thinking back to like this sort of, or, or the feeling you might still have of the really good time in Pantera mm -hmm. when when things were really going well, is there a kind of a memory that stands out of like uh, you? Could, you could tell us about just uh, the sort of sense of what that was like when it was on a good night. Well, you have to understand there were some very strong personalities in Pantera, and when you had eventually, I guess after I, and this is kind of funny, but uh, seemed like I was the new guy until like. Uh, I don't know, six months into Vulgar Display of Power. <laughs> and we had done three records together at that point. And I'd still meet members of the Abbott family who I'd just, you know, met. And they're like, oh, you're the new guy. It's like, yeah, okay, I'm the new guy. But we were always, uh, there was this, 
bond between the guys, and I am talking about Panther, all four of us, uh, Dimebag and I always, we had this, this creative pushing force, and it was like, you know, as far as being tight, that was a given. They were a tight, tight, incredible group, but we would push each other. Stage performance, stage presence, crowd interaction was always a tremendous thing. So once we got past all the bullshit, like, um, and this uh, this could send me in a whole different direction completely. And I will touch up upon it, you know, uh, when I moved to... Texas in 1987, the bar band thing was still this huge thing. And I was always the youngest guy in most any band I was always in. So here I am with older guys, and not just Pantera, a band I was in before Pantera or whatnot. There was this mentality. Pardon the uh, beasts. Uh, Katya, you might want to go pipe that little uh, Shirley down. Shirley got out. Peanut butter. Yeah, ain't gonna work. A, a muzzle and sutures might do. <laughs> really? All right, so... Uh, my point was this, man. Yeah. The train of thought going into uh, you join a band with a older guys who've been around longer and whatnot. The idea was if you played in these bars and you were this type of bar band, that I guess your chances of being discovered were better. Okay. Well. When I was 16, 17 years old, there was no scene. There was no, there was nobody that was going to discover you despite all the rules. And the rules were very strict. And I mean, I guess this is where all this, that's talked about the glammy past of Pantera and all like that. You have to understand, we, you, you could not even come close to getting the gig if you didn't look the part, if you didn't play the right cover tunes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, there were some bars that if a uh, more of a sympathy, but also, uh, what did you put? How did you put it? You had good reasons for good reasons. Okay. There you go. Good reasons. There is no good fucking reason to stick a needle of heroin in your arm and i did it and once again i think it was a mentality of this can't kill me this can't stop me this cannot even get me the way it does other people because i'm this super superhuman monster and i'm indestructible well that was bullshit it couldn't even addict me that fell false. No, there's no good reason for anyone doing dope. But it was a progressive ladder of... Once again, you know, the pain medications, the grinding, grinding road and how quickly you can go from one pill to five pills to 10 pills. There is a ladder, a gradual ladder of destruction going on inside of me. Not many people can come back from that. Not many people can cold turkey a situation like that, but they have, you know, I'm not the only one, I'm not the only one that's done it, I'm not the only guy that's quit it, come back to it, 
quit it, come back to it, and fail over and over and over till you get it fucking right. You know, till you say that's enough. And another thing that was frustrating for me was I was searching out any doctor that could possibly help me. I remember being on tour, being riddled with drugs, but still getting up in the morning, getting in a cab, going to see some specialists who looked at me like I was out of my fucking mind. And then you bring up the word injured back. You bring up the word ruptured disc, and they look at you even colder like... You're fucked, man. You're fucked. I'm talking about the middle 90s, where I damn well know from experience that neurology had not come it had not advanced far enough. So these doctors, basically, who at the time I felt like I was getting shafted, They were basically trying to tell me, man, if we give you this surgery, you're going to be ruined. Back surgery is, especially the type of back surgery that you need, is the percentage of people bouncing back for real was very low. Very low percentage. And like I say, the 90s, there was no stopping anything. Can I come in? Yeah, definitely, man. Was, was that, um, would you say that that was the principal reason for the breakup of Pantera, really, this, this, as a result of all this pain that we went through and all that, that whole time? Well, it most certainly didn't help, but you got to understand, man, when you are wounded and the only escape is either sleep or some sort of narcotic. That is a shit existence, man. It sucks. I'll tell you. Because when you open your eyes, and the second you open your eyes, you feel that knife and there's right in the base of your spine. It's like, God damn it, I don't even want to be here. I don't even want to wake up, much less... Get up, stretch it out, and get on a fucking stage tonight, you know? I I was, in a lot of ways, I needed a fucking break. And yet, with this drug intake, they're not called painkillers for no reason. The more you take, the more it erodes the will kills your true self, numbs it down, numbs it down, your emotions, everything, numb down. And I am a willful person. I do what thou wilt, so to speak. But at this point in my life, I was, like I say, very vulnerable, scared, Easily coerced, weak, weak weak-minded, completely different person. Such is the synthetic bullshit that drugs leave behind in your system, the residue. You know, no one thinks about that. No one puts all this together. It's it's, it's, uh, a no-win situation for anyone, you know? So I think, you know, that... My attitude on tour definitely wore on the other guys, for sure. When, especially when they looked to me to be the willful guy, the 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 stand-up guy, the the tough guy of the band, for God's sake, or whatever. I, the, the the muscle that, uh, and, and believe me, I saw this too. I, I noticed it all, and that adds to. The shame of it all. My, 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 I was ashamed. You know? I didn't never, never want to be seen as a symbol of weakness. 
It was totally counterproductive to my existence. Therefore, the band's existence, because whatever I, you know, you feel on the inside, you're going to project on the outside. Do I think it broke the band up? I think there was a lot of things uh, that, you know, it didn't help. I'll put it that way. And one quick thing of train, a train of thought that I just had in my head. When I think about me projecting this ugly version of Phil, and the distance that it caused the band, at the same time we were growing into different people too. No matter what, I'm not a tit bar guy. I'm not a gambling casino loving guy. I don't, you know, it just it just does nothing nothing for me. You know, I. This is not my thing. Whereas the rest of the guys, tit clubs every night, gambling every night, strip club, strip club, strip club, blah, 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 ah, party, and I couldn't do these things. I couldn't do it. I couldn't just hang out anymore. There was no hanging out for me, man. And the reason why? There was a knife driving into my spine. I couldn't do it. So, on, you know, with the, 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 I guess the last thing I had I could touch on was I always felt like they resent, uh, like the guys in the band resented my condition, and. There is a great percentage of my emotion where I, I, I understand where they're coming from. But then again, there was a misunderstanding, too. You know, they it's like I, I tell people, you know, you don't know chronic pain till you feel it for yourself. And other people, you can describe your pain all day long, knife in the back, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But if they can't feel it, they're not going to understand what the fuck you're talking about. So there was this lack of understanding from them. And I guess I resented that. And then every excuse, every reason I gave for over drinking or pain pills or anything like that completely goes out of the fucking window the second the band finds out the hard way that I'd been doing heroin now there's no trust then there was no trust at all that I understand at the time did I understand it not at all but from seeing young people now struggling with drugs and I here I am a veteran a recovered drug addict telling them every rule in the book, you know, okay, you can't do this, can't do this, can't do this, and then seeing them, walking them off clean and straight, go right back to the fucking drugs. You feel like you just wasted a great portion of your life. You can't do it. You can't make someone do it. So you can't, you know, it's got to be a personal choice to really want to uh, take control of your life back I'm getting off the subject but in any way no, I think I'm sure you got some stuff in there that's really clear I think uh, so you were saying that uh, there was misunderstanding do you think um, when when you kind of separated in a way from them and then you had a side project do you think did that create misunderstanding as well absolutely and by all accounts there's no fucking way I should have been... If I was going to do a side project, doing a record would be one thing. But there I was touring. And the whole idea behind this side band, Super Joint Ritual, was to get my ass out of the arenas and go feel what it's like to be back in the clubs again with that intimate gathering and uh, I love all that. You know, that's fine and dandy, but... I shouldn't have been doing gigs to be to begin with. 
And that's where the erosion of the will comes in. Can't say no. Hey, man, we got this chance to do gigs. Where's Phil? Annihilated next the next room. Go ask him if he wants to do some gigs. I don't care. Sure, whatever. No will. No will. I was weak. Weak, weak, weak. And I could see where being in Pantera, watching this guy who was supposedly injured, too injured to continue with Pantera, sit here and do gig after gig with this fucking other band, I'd be pissed off too. And I get it. Do I have a excuse? Yeah, here's my excuse. I had no fucking will. I was an eroded, big, giant pussy being yanked around, jerked around, and allowing myself the ultimate contradiction in, in me. You know, I'm the captain of this fucking ship, man. Can't use those big words for back then, though. Not at all. It's hard to kind of get get uh, away from that to sort of a, a more mundane thing where we're like talking about the uh, the twentieth anniversary of um, the Volga display of power. It's hard getting away from it when it keeps being brought up in your life. Next question. <laughs> I was gonna, well, uh, yeah, just maybe one more on that then. Just, just. Uh, Wait, whatever. We gotta do what you gotta do, man. Um, I'm an open book. Everyone would like to see some kind of uh, what's the word? Rapprochement or get it, uh, coming together again of of you guys mm -hmm. um, and. There's always this kind of... Did you use the word reproach? <laughs> Rapproche. Well, Aha. Uh -huh. I'm trying to be too... Uh, you know, French. French, exactly. Uh, um, and the thing, the thing is, um, there's a lot of pain in, the, in all this, uh, with Dimebag's death, mm -hmm. a lot of pain in, the, in the, the both sides. You have a lot of pain, and obviously, from what you've said. It's, like, it's very clear there's a really strong feeling still. I imagine Vinny still has a lot of pain from the, the death of his brother, and he probably, uh, you know, well, who knows what he thinks. Uh, we'll, we'll hopefully we'll interview him eventually. But uh, he, he is uh, beyond all that. Is is there some kind of uh, sit Vinny and? Uh, well, Vince, Paul, and I are my body's opposite as two people can get. But you put us in the same room together with the sole purpose of writing music, we could jive that way. Vinny Paul watched his own flesh and blood get shot multiple times right in front of his very eyes. I am in no way, shape, or form going to test nor judge what he is feeling inside. But I lost a brother too. But does the fact that I lost a brother too mean that he needs to act any other way than he's acting? I'm not sure. But I'll say this. I've said in numerous interviews that I think it would be so healthy, healthy for me, for Vince, and Rex to sit down And not have this gigantic this gigantic separation 
to where there is absolutely no chance at healing. That to me feels unhealthy. To have a, a loose end in life, that feels wrong in, the, in, the, in my heart. Once again, I cannot think for Vince. Do I wish he'd want to sit down and speak with me? Of course. Dying for the guy to sit down with me. Matter of fact, I've even written in emails. You know, Vince, if it takes, if you're, if it's just this wall of anger and you feel like you need to just beat me up, I'll let you. I'll let you just beat me up as long as we can sit down after and talk. Whatever it takes, man. So, you know, it is what it is. And I think, uh, my, just to wrap it up, really, I, 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 my door is always open. That's all I can say. If any Paul wants to call this house, wants to get in touch with me, wants to talk about anything, if he wants to scream at me, whatever, he knows where to find me. And I wish it could happen. I really do. I really, really do. So anyone else out there that wishes Pantera would reunite or, or whatnot, you know, uh, better get in line. Because, you know, there isn't a day that goes by that I don't think about this very fucking thing. Okay, great. Uh, Hold your display of power. Somebody's Sorry? Crunch, crunching you. But a uh, vulgar display of power, I mean, where, does it seem like 20 years? Sometimes, and then sometimes, no. You know how it is. You look back at stuff, it's like, time flies. And then sometimes, you know, I don't know. I, it, I get both ways, it, you know. Yes, it seems long, and then sometimes, like I said, just said, it's like fucking just like it was yesterday, you know. I mean, when you get something like a, an anniversary edition, you know, <laughs> there's a there's a whole bunch of uh, kids, teenage kids, twenty year old kids who who never heard it in the first place, and suddenly, you know, there's a lot of publicity and so on, so they'll they'll listen to it, um, and, and it'll be completely new to them. I mean, just that's always s stunning in a way, isn't it? Like, do you think this is, can there be a 40th anniversary and a 60th? I mean, is this a, a record that will last and last? That's tough for me to answer. Really, uh, I'll leave that to the conjecture and judgment of the fans out there, you know, of all ages, all age groups. But you bring up this new wave of uh, youngsters out there that, like you say, it's for their first listen, their first spin with Pantera. And, you know, it, it, it's hard for me to judge it because when Vulgar Display came out, heavy metal production, the sound of heavy metal, was going through so many changes. And we were at the forefront of this more modern sounding thing. So at the time, it was this, this modern sounding heavy metal, unbelievably tight, angry group. And 20 years later, you know, you've had so many bands that have used that same formula since then. You know, it's, I, I don't know what kids will think. So, you know, I, I don't know. That's a good question. <clears throat> I'll leave that up to them to answer. Uh, I, I'll uh, ask a supplementary question on that. Cause, uh, so at the time when you were making that, you had the, did you have a sense of like the, 
the, the tightness, the kind of, it had a lot of rhythm in it too. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, that was our strength. We didn't pantser, I didn't have to, we knew uh, one of our main strengths as songwriters and as uh, a genre band, we did not have to play fast for the sake of speed. We didn't have to do anything for the sake of extremity. We knew that our, our strengths were our, our uh, rhythmic shaking of the room, so to speak. You know, uh, we knew what moved the audience, you know. We knew what our strengths were, so, you know. Definitely, I got to agree with you, you know. We were a rhythmic force. I thought that was me. No, it's my gut. <laughs> Let's just uh, have a, a look on the uh, sort of influence question. Uh, which bands would you point to and say that Pantera had influenced? Did you, like you said, an awful lot of bands came after you. Oh, I don't know. I, you just said to me... Uh, I don't, I, I'm not going to name drop any bands, but there's a lot of bands out there, uh, modern bands, even bands that have been around for a decade at least or more that, you know, you can hear, yeah, you know, like just little things like production. You can hear where Daryl's guitar tone has been mimicked as best as possible and Finney's drum tones have been mimicked, uh, you know. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of tough-ass lead singers out there with, you know, uh, these days who, when they speak and address the audience, uh, I, guess, uh, I guess I've been used as a prototypical... Uh, um, what's cool to say to the audience type guy, uh, whatever you call it. So, I've seen it. I've seen it all, so. Good. Keep on chugging away, youngsters. I, you know, I did the same thing, man. You know, music is one just gigantic influence, you know. You know, from, from decade to decade to decade, to genre to genre to genre. Everybody has their own damn influences, and, you know, such is music. You, you're still out there, you're still performing, uh, you know, long after, in spite of everything that's happened with your back and so on. But um, uh, how, do you, how do you deal with, like, on the one hand, you've got this long-term health problem, really, on the other hand, you're absolutely driven to keep. Well, you, it takes work, you know. After I had major back surgery in 2006, I was warned ahead of time, you know, this is going to be with you the rest of your life, and to have any quality of life that can be considered a good quality of life, you're going to have to work for it. And... I embraced physical therapy, full throttle, and, it, it, you know, it's, it's really, you know, like I say, neurology, uh, at one point in time, the doctor wanted to take the titanium that is in my lower back out at one time, after everything had settled and grown in, what, a couple years later, after surgery, you know, I'll walk in the room and the doctor's like, whoa, look at you, uh, standing up straight and you look great. You look like you're a different person. When you first walked in here, you were sad-eyed and slumped over and could barely sit down and walk. And I'm like, wow, he remembers all this stuff. But I've got the feeling from the doctor as well that neurology is like rolling the dice, man. It's like either, you know, you don't know what the patient's, how the patient is really going to react. You know, are they really going to embrace the physical therapy? Or are they just going to let the pounds get on as they keep taking pain medicine, pain medicine, pain medicine? 
I decided I did not want that jail cell in my life anymore. And like I say, when I embraced this stuff, I embraced it big time. I didn't miss one meeting with these uh, wonderful place down the street. Uh, Rehab Dynamics was the name of the lady's name is Susan. And she brought me so far, man. She brought me so far, taught me about keeping my, my core strong and re-strengthening all that stuff. And it took five good years before I could say, wow, life is different. You know, because every morning, no matter what your day consists of, there's stretching routine that to me for my life it's mandatory it's mandatory you've got to stretch it out you've got to get blood flowing you got to you know that there's still a, some uncomfort uh, uncomfortable moments in the morning certain days especially living in the where we live here in the gulf coast and Pressure drops, weather changes. You can feel it, in, you know, physicality, bad knees, whatever. I busted both my knees on stage, man. You know, pain is as relevant as you let it be. You know, there is such a thing as a mental callus, as I like to call it, you know. It toughens up, toughens up. You and I were speaking earlier, and I said, if I was thinking about it right now, sure, I could feel a foreign object in my back right now. Does it mean it controls my life anymore? Nope. Because the callus is built. Because I have put in the hard time and the hard work, and it's true. The harder you work at rehabbing, it's like an elite athlete, you know what I'm saying? It, 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 if you want to get back on the football field, you're going to rehab your ass off till you're able to get back out there without the risk of, you know, re-injuring or whatnot. I know that that risk is always there. So these days it's like I know what not to do, what I shouldn't do, that I might still do, but at least I know to keep my core strong and at least I'll Put that damn bottle down. Jeez, damn. I can't, I can't even smell whiskey anymore without ugh, getting the old gag reflex. It's like, man, no more nips for the kid. You know, all that stuff comes with the territory, though. You know, uh, especially when you're rehabbing your back and you're in the midst of it. There's no time to wake up with a hangover. No time at all to be half-assing it through rehab. No way. No way. And I can't tell you how many different phases this back thing went through. Like at one point, when I would bend this way, you could hear an audible thudding. Thud, 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 thud. And it was like, what the hell is that? And it was, you know, it felt like, kind of like when your back pops, but it was not that and I went and saw my surgeon. I'm like, put your ear up to my back right here. I should have broke wind, but no, I, I, I said, put your ear up right there. And I bent and bent, and I, he heard this noise. I said, what the hell is that, Doc? And he best neurosurgeon in this area. He's like, I have no idea. I said, well, what is it? When is it going to go? Hey, what, what's going on, man? I have no idea. Sure enough year later, whatever, quit doing it. Quit doing it. No more thudding, no more whatever. Which leads me to believe it's some sort of fascia breaking up or something like that. So I don't, I don't know. It's interesting, man. It's been a heck of a journey. You learn a lot about yourself. It hasn't stopped you. Mm -mm. Stage performances now, do you, would you, clearly you're going to be a little careful there. Right? Yeah, absolutely. But, you know, I, I don't have to be this insane dynamo up there on the stage that's going to leap from the drum riser to the stage to the crowd. I don't have to do all that. 
you know, it's not required. You know, that's why they've got this stuff called songs. You get to sing them. <laughs> that's tough enough. Uh, is Down still the main project for you? No, no, Down is a project. Is it the main project? I don't know what my my main project really is. Housecore Records and the bands that lie within and shit. I have a solo record I've been doing and, and, and you know, I just, I love music so much. So many, uh, so much about music. Uh, so many different genres. So, you know, I, once again, I'm working to my strengths. I know what my forte is. I know what my calling is. I know what my genre and my style of music that that, that is. I guess uh, the best that I do. And I, you know, people might have different opinions. You know, because I can scream as good as anyone. I can sing too. I'm not gonna say as good as anyone, but I can sing, carry a goddamn note, and I do that in down where I'm relied to, or relied on to actually hit real notes <laughs> I have to be in key you know uh you know I like I like singing sometimes but I like screaming sometimes and I like you know I like all that. I love it I, I love it I love writing songs I love producing bands I love the whole process I love it I just I, one final thing I think how would you rate uh Daryl as a guitarist uh in the as you say, you you love so many different kinds of music. I mean, there's so many amazing guitarists. Would you rate? How would you rate Daryl as a guitarist? Thinking back, I still think to this day. You know, when you're on the inside with a guy like Dimebag Daryl, I'll even go as far to say he's underrated, because I don't think he even showed. He showed one side of himself, really. You know, we were writing heavy metal songs, and sure, he could do the blistering leads and all that whatnot. He's an excellent lead player, excellent, excellent, excellent rhythmic player. But the guy could play anything, really, you know. I have bragged about it before, but, the, you know, if if those guys wanted to sound exactly like a country and western band just for a couple seconds they could just break into it and man it sounded authentic if he wanted to play in a i don't know uh he could do anything man he could do anything and if he wasn't sure of the uh, genre that he was going for but he had an idea his take on it would be interesting you know it's like whoa and he was a master of a four track and he was a songster he loved singing he loved to sing <sighs> you know much to everybody else's chagrin sometimes but it was funny man but he loved singing too so he was a great guitar player and uh, so much more than just a heavy metal guitar player especially if you grew up with him Right there on the inside. I, I, he just, jack of all trades, man, you know, as a musician, you know, just unbelievable. Do you miss him? Every day. Every day of my life. Several moments a day. I'm surrounded by musicians. There's little mementos, mementos laying around everywhere, platinum records upstairs, gold records next door at the friggin' jam room, guitar picks, little things, and you know what, none of that matters because I'd probably still be thinking about him anyway.
Great man, too. Good man. Great man. And when he wanted to be, he could be even greater. One of the biggest hearts I've ever been around, come across. Intense, intense character. Spoke his own language. I, you know, I hear his voice every day. Something, no matter what I do. Even when I don't feel like working out, tired of it, sick of the grind, I can hear him in the background, get your ass up, Anselmo. <laughs> Put in the hard work, you young son. It's worth it. Every day. Thanks, Phil. <clears throat> That's Is there anything the... you would like to say, by the way, before we stop? Anything <clears throat> Just... To me, the story of Pantera will always be a good one, an inspiring one. There's been, like, uh, probably said it in this fucking interview, but I've been doing a lot of interviews lately, so I'll just go ahead and get it out again. It's been a lot of bands. We're not the first band to have a drug problem fall on us, an alcohol problem, and then death, murder. It just, it makes me think about a guy like John Lennon. And when his life is celebrated, it's a beautiful thing a whole lot of times, most times, as it should be. And that's how I think about Dimebag. That's how I think about the years with Pantera. Those are years that should be celebrated. Not the bitter, ugly ending. Was there a band falling out? Sure. We're not the first. Dimebag being murdered. Can I come to grips with that? Hell no. There's not. There's a bit. There's a part, tremendous part, part of me that, you know, you, there's, how can you reason with insanity? You can't. And if you stay there long enough trying to reason with this ins insanity, you sink. At least I do. I, I sink. I can't progress. I have chosen to take that proverbial step forward. I need to walk forward, man. Not sideways, not backwards. And in order to do that, you've got to move on. Doesn't mean out of sight, out of mind. We've been over that. He's uh, Dimebag is in mind. Pantera is in mind. Every day, I just choose because I feel like it's healthy for me to look at the, the good stuff because there's plenty of it on a percentage of the body of whatever the fuck happened to Pantera from here to the end. I mean, it's got to be 95% fucking awesome, great story. And I know, I know the, tra well, the weight of tragedy. I know this. Very clear on it. Once again, I'm taking the John Lennon route. It's the songs that you leave behind that are forever. Death is just death. That's all it is. No matter how it comes and grabs, it's going to get us all. Tragic, yeah. But Pantera, especially during this time, when we're celebrating the 20th anniversary of Vulgar Display of Power, 
This is the ultimate time to look at the good. And every day I gotta look at the good. And I know the critics or whatnot can say, well, Phil just is not choosing to look at the bad because he he's in the equation as far as the bad goes a whole lot, so don't look that way. That's bullshit. Believe me, I've taken a good, cold, long, hard fucking stare in the mirror. I know who the fuck I am. I know the mistakes I've made. Therefore, I can move on. And whether that makes sense to anyone else, I could give a fuck. I know what I'm saying. And I have moved on. And Pantera will be a fond memory. Dimebag will always be. <laughs> you can't take away those beautiful memories. He's going to be a, a fantastic memory in my heart till I hit the dirt. And when it comes to Pantera and healing, all I can say is my door is wide fucking open. We could probably end right there. Fantastic, yeah.